to this being mm. uh, HIV and AIDS being so stigmatized, yeah, um, that there was so much shame involved with the, their deaths, mm. um, that there was no cel- there was no celebration, there was no uh, remembrance, there wasn't yeah. even uh, conversation. So mm. um, really, what this was doing was kind of um, mm. making sure they weren't forgotten, making sure yeah. they weren't just a, another uh, you know name in the statistical board. Mm. Um, so really, to, to be able to see the um, the uh, the smile on her mother's face when she's able to talk about her dead son. Mm. <laughs> um, proud yeah. of all the things that he accomplished in his life and not, mm. not at all being ashamed of the, the fact that he died of AIDS. Mm. Um, that's been a huge, um, uh, mm. uh, the influence that I see the co-op has had on these individuals. Mm. You know, they, you know, there isn't a grave site. I mean, some, you know, there's, yeah. it's that kind of idea is that they can come to these places to, um, yeah. to, to, to mourn. Um, mm. We also have uh, an archive um, at Quilt Archive, we have over half a million articles. So every letter, if you can imagine, or every panel that we received, you can imagine someone writing a letter that came with it. Yeah. They also would send in postcards, they send in um, mm-hmm. photographs. They also send in, for instance, if the person mm-hmm. was a chef, we'll get a whole cookbook of their <laughs> of, uh, of oh, recipes wow. that they were showcased in. Yeah. Um, we'll get, uh, more recently, we'll get CDs of if it was an artist. Mm-hmm. It would be a CD of their artwork. Yeah. Um, uh, and then later on, for instance, if the person's son or daughter was written about in an mm-hmm. article, they'll send us that article because mm-hmm. they know that it's a, it's a living archive. And yeah. so it continually grows. And so we'll mm-hmm. make sure that it goes into that person's archive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This one guy died, he's got six or seven brothers and sisters. And mm-hmm. every time the panel comes to one of their local um, displays, yeah. the deal is um, that the brothers and sisters have, a le- will have to leave some memento um, for the panel. And what they did was, um, in the panel, it's yeah. got a pair of jeans, um, just on the very yeah. top part of the jeans, and he's got two pockets, and the pockets have zippers on it. Mm-hmm. And so they leave a handwritten, like a little note zippers. that says, yeah. thinking yeah. of you today, and they put a date of their visit, and then they unzip mm-hmm. the zipper. And so it's funny to see, but this oh, pair of yeah. jeans has these pockets full yeah. <laughs> because of all the displays that this um, panel is sent to where a brother and sister has come. Mm-hmm. You know, I pulled it, we um, had a display um, already um, folded up, and I went and pulled the one block out for him because he just, he's like, my mom's going to kill me if I don't leave this note. <laughs> so uh, we yeah. opened it up just so he could leave the note inside the pocket for that person. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so sweet. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And so, yeah, that story, that kind of story does live on. As long as the story is out there, and the story doesn't have to be that yeah. this, this, this person died of, uh, of yeah. AIDS and that's all they were about. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's what their life encompassed. And I think that's really mm. a part of the reason why the, um, the quote is so powerful. Um, yeah. Because people, you know, in the early days, it was you heard the, heard the name if they died of AIDS, that's where the story ended. <laughs> yeah. And so this is a way for that story to become um, more of a legacy. I'm retired. I'm 81 years old. I'm the oldest queer y'all have ever seen in public. <laughs> when in 1981, in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to the first meeting with a friend of mine from my real estate office. And we're sitting there, and you go around and you discuss things. And while I'm telling about my anonymity, and obviously the person I'm talking about, Paul Killebrew was there, and he stood up, and here was this man, he was about six foot three, absolutely one of the most gorgeous men I've ever seen in my life. And I was young then, I could appreciate it. and he stands up and he says, y'all don't know how bad it is. He said, I still go to bars, but I don't drink. And nobody will talk to me. Now, this is my first meeting there. And I hold up my hand and I say, it's no damn wonder. You're so damn good looking. Who, uh, who would be a, uh, have the nerve to talk to you? I'd be turned down. And everybody just thought that was the wildest thing they'd ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> but at his funeral... His parents lived out past Marietta, so you know they were out in the woods. They held it at a Baptist church. Half the congregation was people from AA and the gay community. The other half were people from the church. And during the service, the minister said, we all suffered because of Paul's undesirable life. Well, I wanted to get up and walk out, but I didn't. But, you know, that was the attitude that we faced back in the early 80s. Paul died probably 85, I think, 85 or 86. 
there was an organization in Atlanta called Legal Legislating Equality for Gays and Lesbians. And they, they, a guy came from Texas to tell about uh, this organization, set one up here, and his whole thing was to get delegates to go to the Democratic, or to run for running to, for the Democratic Convention, which is going to be here in Atlanta. Well, I invited 50 of my friends, if you can believe I have 50 friends. I have more than that now. But um, it was a question, I invited them to my house for a cocktail party. And the guy made this big pitch about it and all that. And, he, and these were supposedly the quote unquote leaders of the gay and lesbian community. And at the end he said, now, who wants to volunteer? Not a hand went up. And I said, well, hell, I'll do it. I never thought I'd get elected. I'm sort of like Donald Trump. I never thought I was going to get elected. And so it turns out that I got elected. And, uh, and that, that set, set it on fire. In the article that came out in the Atlanta Constitution in 1988, had about the Democratic caucuses in DeKalb County. And it was this long list. I mean, a long article. And in the seventh paragraph, uh, the reporter said, and I spoke with Dick Rhodes, uh, the first openly gay delegate to be elected to thing. And he said, you're going to hear from the gay and lesbian vote in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to work on Monday, and my boss said, you're in deep check. Uh, I said, what? And he said, she said, the article, it was in the paper. And I said, it was seven paragraphs down before my name was even in the article. And she said, well, they're very upset with it. I worked for a hotel that was owned by, it was Lanier Business Products, and it was owned by the Harris Corporation out of Florida, which is a multi-million dollar uh, defense contractor and all this. And so... They, she said, they're sending somebody up from the Harris Corporation to talk with you. And I slinked around the hotel for three, huh? 1988. And I was slinking around the hotel trying to avoid everybody in management, which I did a good job. My office was in the basement. And then after about three days, I said, I'm tired of this. And so I went to my boss and I said, you know, Georgia is a non, uh, what is that? Right to work. Oh, a right to right work to work state. Yeah. And we, there's, you can fire somebody for any reason you want to fire them. And I said, I realize that. But I said, what I plan to do is sue the Harris Corporation, which has all these national defense contracts, and see how much trouble I can cause the Harris Corporation. The next day I was told, don't worry, they're not coming up. Sometimes you have to stand up for what you believe in. You can join my Facebook page. It's Richard G. Rhodes at Facebook.com. So um, the local panel here is Etc., which uh, was a, a, a gay magazine, mainly for gay men, but I mean, for everyone. When it's, it's sort of a bar guide, uh, small, small magazine. And um, Richard and I knew uh, Ray Kluka. Ray Kluka. Do you want to talk about Ray a little bit? Anything you want to say about him? Well, I'm just going to say he, he was the editor of Etc. Et cetera. And he was very active in s several other organizations. With Ray, um, I knew Ray really, really well. He was like a brother to me. So um, I think it was about 88 that he was diagnosed. Um, and, um, and we would have these like, late night phone conversations. And I remember one of the last conversations we had, he passed away in June of 1989. And um, he said to me one day, he said, uh, my doctor tells me that I have this you know, condition, this certain thing going on with me. And he says, I'm gonna have it for the rest of my life. But the good news is that won't be too long. <laughs> oh, that was, that was one of the things that helped us survive is we had this really black gallows humor that we would laugh and we had a big laugh about it on the phone, you know. Um, and they also used to call the um, obituaries the gay men's sports pages. 
So sorry, <laughs> jokes are not going over at all. But, <laughs> but that's, what we, that's what got us through, is, is yeah. having that. And so that's what I would also recommend, is to have that kind of a sense of humor and tongue in cheek and say, okay, you know, especially like as Richard was saying, I mean, you know, we're in really hard times. I never really thought of that we would be in the situation that we're in right now. You know, especially with like, um, you know, the, this administration trying to eradicate trans people. You know, trying to say, you know, there's no such thing. It's like, oh, please, <laughs> spare us. Anyway, so, so Ray uh, was, was, again, like a dear friend of mine, and, and I'm glad that there is a park in his, in his honor. When the first drug came out for AIDS, AZT, it killed about as damn many people as the disease killed. I mean, it was a very toxic uh, thing, and so many people who took it thinking it was going to save their lives, it ended up getting and killing them quicker. So. When you talk about the whole story, I mean, it's really an indictment of our public health care, or lack thereof. And one of the big problems we had um, is that when this happened and, you know, people realized this was going on, uh, who was the president? Reagan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my dear. Yes. And, you know, not as bad as Trump, actually. <laughs> but um, but the start. But, a, yeah, conservative, uh, right-wing Republican. They didn't do anything, you know, they just let us die. I mean, the public health, the only person that I remember who really was an ally and accomplished something was the Surgeon General, Everett Koop. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I think he basically covered his ass politically, so they left him alone, <laughs> which was great. Yeah. So he would be outspoken and he would talk about, what, Reagan didn't even talk, he didn't even mention AIDS mm -hmm. until I think 1987. The, even the quilt uh, from its founding story, um, after a candlelight kind of vigil, that the night before, um, Cleve Jones had instructed everyone uh, or the group to hide these ladders um, next to the federal building in these bushes because they were going to hide. So at the end of this, um, this march, of the vigil, uh, that they hoisted up these ladders and then, um, as everyone was instructed, on a placard to write someone that they knew who died of AIDS. Right. And so then all of a sudden these ladders go up placards are being taped on the wall on the sides of the federal building and then Cleve steps back and it kind of reminded him of a quilt and so this is where the whole conceptually where the whole um, the idea of the quilt came from. And Cleve Jones was uh, an activist who was uh, mentored by Harvey Milk, uh, sort of a protege of Harvey Milk and you've seen the movie and Cleve Jones is the major character in that movie and, and he's the person who, who yep. is the founder, yeah. uh, originator of the quilt. Everybody knew who Cleve Jones was, and he was like a major activist on, on the front covers of gay magazines and newspapers, and, and they said how, how to have media savvy. And so he was like a, he was like a role model for us, um, and anybody who wanted to be an activist. So. And that's why, too, <laughs> and for this event to happen in 85 and for us yeah. to be founded in 87, 87, it was two years of him pitching to any and everyone about this concept of, uh, of the quilt. Um, aside from the, um, the, uh, the fact that it was uh, reminiscent of the quilt of the placards on the wall, um, the idea also was from, you know, the, um, how could you get this in conversations around the kitchen table? Um, you know, when you think of the quilt, first thing that comes to mind really is grandma, um, mm -hmm. comfort, home, sharing, legacy, all that kind of um, warm stuff. It mainly, is, for instance, for us it was a, if, um, I guess later on it was more of us, how can we get this in a, um, uh, in the, conversation right um, uh, if you're not going to talk about sex in schools or anything like yeah, so gonna, yeah. this way was actually our teachers educators have informed us is kind of a uh, foot in the door because right. the conversation um, they can bring these quotes to these schools um, that um, and they don't have to the the curriculum is not about HIV and AIDS um, but the questions are going to come up how did this person get on this quilt and that's a conversation that the kids then go home and talk about and so this was a way to tap into that so that the conversations could be had at those kitchen tables around the United States, around the world. And I think one of the visions he had was that, was that the quilt is a comforter. It's a, it's a source of comfort. And, yeah. and that's what it has become, I mean, in terms of an outlet 
for, for, you know, for grief and for remembrance, for celebration.